This episode is sponsored by Brilliant. I'm sure you've seen them, jumping around all willy-nilly like the whole world was their personal trampoline. And if not, you've definitely heard them chirping non-stop like that. It's a racket is what it is. Can't turn it off and God forbid one gets stuck in your house at night. It's like nature's version of a pager going off in a movie theater. And they're not about to shut up either, because what they've got going on has been working for them for quite a long time. About 350 million... What's that one doing, Jerry? Well, I don't know either, but it looks dirty. Well, change it. About 350 million years ago, the ancestors of the Orthopterans, the crickets, grasshoppers, and katydids, started to get a bit jumpy. It turns out having a quick getaway is quite helpful if you want to be not dead. Jerry, what? that one didn't even try. Well, I'm talking about how good they are at getting away. And you show that? Anyway, those early Orthopterans didn't skip leg day at the gym, I'll tell you what. Those back legs in particular got quite thick. You can see it on Rebecca here. Would you turn a bit? There, look at that. And that's because these jumps they do are pretty hardcore. There's a whole technique to it. The basic idea here is that you bend your knee. I mean, it's backwards, but whatever. And then something keeps that knee bent while you build up force that wants to unbend your knee. Now in the crickets, they're old school. The knee is kept in place by their muscles. But in the grasshoppers, when they split off from the crickets, they added a latch and a spring. The latch means that less force is required to lock the knee in place. And then the spring is a way to store energy as the muscles contract. Then all you do is trip the latch and pop. Now because of the force that this latch and spring system generates, these jumps can be explosive. You gotta jump! Huh. Ah! During takeoff, a grasshopper can be subjected to over 20 Gs of acceleration. I mean, it's a bit like strapping a rocket to your ass to go to the grocery store. You're gonna get there, but it might not be pretty. They can do their best, though, aim by facing where they want to go, or by pushing off with one leg slightly before the other. Now, if they slip while they're doing it, it could potentially be an issue. You know, like when you try and kick something real hard and miss, like Charlie Brown style. You could break a leg, so locusts, which are a kind of grasshopper, have a region on their forelegs which is designed to buckle and absorb some of that force. Now this buckling can be pretty extreme, and certainly doesn't look comfortable. But it also comes in handy if you want to use some of that power in a kick. Because those legs aren't just for jumping, and they have a pretty impressive range of motion. So if some creepy giant tries to do some paint by numbers on your back, you can give him the what for. Or if you have to kick the crap out of some bully, while everyone watches. <laughs> oh dang, no, it's a throwdown. Those legs can also kick the crap. Jerry, is that a mistake? Kick the crap out of what? Oh, just kick the crap. Oh, and that's why you should never give orthopterans a foot massage. This here is a bush cricket or katydid. Katydids and crickets don't have that latch and spring. But whatever they lack in explosive power, they make up for in finesse. Look at that, nailed the landing. And if you give them a whole bunch of different heights, they adjust to it so their body's at the right angle on the approach. And it's not just the straight up and downs either. Look at that, that's some Cirque du Soleil right there. During takeoff, katydids and crickets can look downright elegant, like they're in some sort of a diving competition. And let me tell you, if you're thinking about a career in science, you might just end up tickling the bottoms of bush crickets with a brush. Explain that to your parents. Anyway, you'll notice that after it gets airborne, this one sort of puts its front legs out to the side. Changing their body posture mid-flight allows them to stabilize like this spider cricket here. And that helps control the landing. Anyway, I think you get the idea. They're good at jumping. But this might not have been the only thing that gave early orthopterans a leg up in escaping pr- God damn it, Jerry! Well, yes, I want a different shot. It's ridiculous. Alright, they're good at jumping, and that's not the only thing that gave them a leg up. You see, the pun's ruined now. Whatever, leg up in escaping predators. Jerry, is this all there is? I don't think you're getting the... Oh, there it is. You had me worried. I'm sorry, Nancy. I'm talking to Jerry. You did great. Listen, you don't need 300 million years of evolution to get a leg up. See, that's how you pun. Brilliant helps you become a better thinker and problem solver with thousands of visual interactive lessons in math, science, programming, data analysis, and AI. This isn't just watching lectures while you drink your latte and pet your cat, neither. That's the cat's name, neither. <laughs> No, Brilliant is designed to be uniquely effective with hands-on problem solving that lets you play with concepts and that's proven to be six times more effective than sitting and staring. And you're not just thrown into the deep end. 
Brilliant starts you with mastering the foundations, then helps you level up to increasingly challenging problems. And that's whether you're learning about digital circuitry, the fundamental building blocks of how computers perform logical operations, all the way to learning how to program with functions. You can do just a little every day and Brilliant keeps you on track. It's a complicated world and it helps to know how it all hangs together, so you don't talk out your butt. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit Brilliant.org slash ZayFrank or or scan the QR code on screen, or just click on the link in the description. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Go check it out today. Brilliant has been a longtime sponsor of this show, and I'm a fan. Where were we? Oh, right. One theory is that the first sounds that orthopterans made were part of a startle response. Some sort of a quick movement where bits rub together, and the sound might cause a predator to hesitate. Another theory is that it was a booty call pretty much from the get-go, but for that to work, they had to evolve ears. Now, you know evolution is a cheap bastard. Never gets something new, just uses whatever crap's lying around. Now, crickets, grasshoppers, and katydids all evolved hearing independently, but they had a lot of the same parts to work with. In crickets and katydids, these receptors in their legs that could sense stretch and vibration were hooked up to these internal air pockets, and then to a thin membrane you can see from the outside. Sound waves in the air cause the membrane to vibrate, and then the sound waves travel to an organ filled with liquid and lined with receptors. The shape and structure of that organ is such that the neurons on one end of it respond best to higher frequencies and the opposite end to lower ones. It's very similar to a sort of unrolled version of what we use to hear, except it's in their f***ing leg. <laughs> to figure out what direction a sound is coming from, they repurpose some additional tubing. I'm telling you, evolution's a real duct tape job. Sound can enter these tubes through these holes that they have on their sides, and then it travels through the body until it hits the inside surface of those membranes that they have on the legs. So a sound wave will hit both the outside of that membrane through the open air, and also the inside surface, but with a delay because it has to travel through that tube. That delay causes the membrane to vibrate differently depending on where the sound is coming from. Now when grass, <laughs> oh hello there, now, when grasshoppers evolved ears, they had a lot of the same raw material, but evidently they lost the blueprint. Ended up with ears on their abdomen. <laughs> you know, can really hear that bean burrito working its way through. <laughs> now, the main thing all these ears are listening for, especially the females, are mating calls. And those evolved independently as well. Orthopterans are essentially nature's vibrator. Jerry, is that true? People use them to... Oh, you just mean they vibrate. Okay. If they want to make a sound, they just rub one out. Now, that's on purpose. It's not? Well, that's even more worrisome. It's called stridulation. The basic idea is you have a row of bumps, like these right here on a cricket's wing. And then you have something that runs over those bumps like you might a fingernail over the ridge of a comb. On crickets and katydids, this row of bumps, or file as they call it, is on one wing, and the fingernail thing, or scraper, is on the other wing. On grasshoppers, always gotta do things different, the file is a row of pegs on the inside of the femur, basically a ribbed inner thigh that they rub against the hardened veins of their forewings. Now the nubbins on these files come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. The frequency of the sound that's made is related to how fast you flick those bumps. So a five kilohertz tone would correspond to a rate of about 5,000 flicks per second. And to sustain something like that, you gotta vibrate back and forth. In some crickets, the spacing on the file varies along its length, so it can alternate between low frequency and high frequency sounds. So between the shape and spacing of the files, the scraper and the way they move, they can create some pretty complex sounds. Some of which are highly annoying. To make those calls even louder, parts of the wing act as resonators that are designed to amplify certain frequencies, especially the ones that the ladies are into. When those resonators vibrate, they create pressure waves or sound in the air on both sides of the wing. But those pressure waves are opposite to each other. When you're pushing air on one side, you're pulling air on the other. So if those waves meet, they cancel each other out. Now normally that's not a problem, but if you're really small compared to the wavelength of the sound you're making, you start getting those cancellations around the edges of your wings. So what this little man does to be heard is to chew a hole through a leaf and stick his top half through it. The leaf acts as a baffle, blocking the waves in the back from interfering with the waves in the front. Now it appears that quite a few crickets simply use the ground for amplification. 
Sound waves are reflected off the ground and back outward. Some of the fancy ones go further and dig burrows that act as resonators, sort of like that hole in the body of an acoustic guitar, hippies. But the mole cricket went above and well below and beyond. They dig these burrows where the openings are shaped like the bell of a horn, sometimes one, sometimes two. Behind that, there's a roundish hollow they call a bulb. Here, you can see some wax casts of the burrows. It doesn't look like much, but these shapes resonate with and amplify the specific frequencies of the male mole cricket's call. They know this because the science hippies have done scans on them to model their acoustics. Although, <laughs> this does look like the backstory for how a turd became a supervillain. <laughs> Anyway, it's this sort of creativity that resulted in orthopteran mating calls being the soundtrack to, well, everything. And here's the kicker, it could be a lot louder. Around 70% of katydids have mating calls at frequencies too high for us to hear, thank God. And you know who gets some of the credit for that? The bats. When they showed up about 50 million years ago, the katydids were like, oh sh**. I mean, they can fly and they hunt by listening. I mean, you can't get worse than that for an insect that's out there blabbing all day. So over time, many katydids' hearing sensitivity and their mating calls shifted up towards the frequencies that bats use to echolocate, so they can hear the bat first before the echo bounces back. I mean, not that one, obviously. And if it's not the bats, it's these f***ers. These flies are tiny, but they evolved a unique hearing structure in their chest, why not? It's very good at localizing sound, and the females use it to hone in on the cricket's chirp. And when they get there, they deposit some bibbies on the cricket. Then those bibbies burrow into the cricket and eat it from the inside out. It's bad enough that some crickets just threw in the towel. In Hawaii, where these flies are everywhere, some of the ocean field crickets have lost most of those little bumps that they use to make sound. Flies can't find them, but they can't make mating calls. So you know what they do? They get close to males who do sing and try to intercept the female. Oh, hey, are you Dave? Like, the one that keeps saying fuck me over and over? I mean, I know they all say that, but it's the way that you said fuck me. You know, fuck me, fuck me, fuck me, fuck me, fuck me, fuck me. I mean, obviously I can't do it right, but anyway. You don't really look like your profile picture. Eh, whatever. <laughs>